months ago, uh, we had a little bit of a controversy here at St. Paul's. It was before COVID-19, so it seems like a whole world ago. The controversy was this. We were down in the basement, and it was me, and there were about five confirmation students. And the controversy was, which is greater, Christmas or Easter? Have you ever had this discussion? Which is the greater holiday, Christmas or Easter? And of course, I won the debate. Whether they'll admit it or not, I won. That doesn't matter too much, but I have to tell you. Um, Christmas or Easter? See, I thought that they were debating which is, the, you know, which is the better service. And I thought they were saying Christmas because, you know how it is, kids love the candlelight service, the lights turning off, that um, kind of intense feeling that you get on Christmas Eve. But they told me pretty quickly, Pastor, that's not what we mean. You know what they meant, don't you? Christmas was better in their minds because you get presents on Christmas, of course. So I got to tell them, well, that's good and well, but the greatest gift of all is Christ, and he came into our world to rise. Christmas without Easter would be empty, right? Now, of course, you don't have to pit these things against each other. They're really, none is greater than the other, but they go together. Still, I would insist, Easter is better than Christmas as much as finishing the race is better than starting it. But it was interesting, nobody even mentioned Pentecost. Nobody even thought to bring up, and I didn't either, is Pentecost as great as Easter? So let's add a third part into the debate this morning. Which is greater, Christmas, Easter, or Pentecost? We don't have all the traditions associated with Pentecost, do we? Maybe we should. Maybe we should have a rip-roaring bonfire. Maybe we should get our families all together and have a feast on Pentecost. I think we should. Not just because I like fire. But because this day is a great and wonderful day for every Christian to celebrate. As much as Easter is the fulfillment of Christmas, I would submit to you today that Pentecost is the fulfillment of Easter. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. Everything Christ has done for us, coming into our world, bearing our sins, dying in our place, rising again, all of the gifts that he promises us, would just be sitting over on a shelf if Pentecost never came. The Holy Spirit delivers to us everything Christ has accomplished for us. And so just as much as you don't just celebrate the day you click the button and, am and you buy something on Amazon, but you celebrate when it actually gets to your house, right? That's how much Pentecost is a great day for every Christian. For Christ did not rise to stay by himself. He didn't rise because he wanted all the glory for himself, but he rose, he raised our human nature so that we might share in his victory. And the Spirit is given to bring you into that victory. So we celebrate today with pomp and circumstance. We have processions and we have special alleluias. We have the chimes ringing because Pentecost is a day worthy of our celebration. For on this day, the Holy Spirit came. And on this day, the Holy Spirit still comes. Now, imagine being there in Jerusalem, right? Imagine being with the disciples in that upper room and hearing and seeing these amazing signs that happened on Pentecost. I want to go through the signs with you this morning because I think in the way that the Spirit shows himself, we see something of his work. So first, imagine hearing a loud, mighty, rushing wind, right? A big whoosh. Maybe some of you watched the, uh, the astronauts go up yesterday. I would imagine that the sound there was a pretty loud one. I wonder if the day of Pentecost was something perhaps a bit like that. We're told that everyone in the city heard this mighty rushing wind, and they came to find out what's making that sound. Now, why does the Holy Spirit, when he comes, why does he make this mighty rushing wind? He doesn't have to, right? The Holy Spirit is not wind. He's not a wind in and of himself, but he chooses when he comes to announce his presence with wind. And I think there's something significant there for us to consider. Think of wind this morning. Wind is an invisible force in our world. You see its effects, right? You can sit out on your porch this afternoon and watch the wind blowing through the leaves. You can hear the wind blowing through the leaves. You can feel it on your face, but you can never actually 
see it. And so it's easy to forget wind. It's easy to forget the power that wind has. Maybe you've had this experience driving down the highway. You go to pass a big semi-truck, and the truck, while you're next to it, is blocking the wind. And you kind of get used to driving next to the truck. But as soon as you pass that truck, what happens? When the wind whips back across your car, you feel it, don't you? That wind that's blowing has the force that can move even a car. The Spirit works much the same way. He is invisible. We can't see him at work, and yet his work is powerful and mighty. There are many winds at work in our world, and by that I don't mean the winds of trade or the wind that blows through the leaves, but I mean it in the way that St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians. He says he wants us not to be blown about by every wind. What he means there is by every spirit. See, in Greek, the same word, noima, means both wind and spirit. You can hear this in our English language, right? Pneumatic drills or a pneumatic hammer is a wind-powered hammer, right? Well, the spirits that are at work in our world are not all the Holy Spirit. I wish I could tell you that every spirit that you hear, every spirit that blows you about in this world is from God. And so just do whatever you want, do whatever you feel. But you know that that's not true, don't you? You know that there are many winds, if you will. There are many spirits that, though you can't see them, are at work in our world. Of course, our modern mindset has tried to deny this, right? We've tried to reduce everything to what is visible, to what can be seen and touched and experimented upon. But we know that there are many spirits at work, and not all are for good. And so the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he comes like this mighty rushing wind to put this question in your mind. What is the wind that is driving you? What is the thing that is at work in your life? What is the force that is pushing you through this world? For there are many winds. Maybe you've never asked yourself that exact question. Many people never do. They simply kind of go through life and take the path of least resistance, like water. But I would ask you this morning, what is the thing that is animating your life? What is driving your, your decisions in your family, at your job, in your life? For there are many spirits at work in this world, and some of them will work alongside the Holy Spirit, but many of them will work at cross purposes. And you don't want to be heading into a headwind, right? You don't want to be living your life opposed to the Holy Spirit. You want to walk with him, even as you would want to walk with the wind at your back. This is why the Spirit is given to us, to inspire us. It's as if Jesus is blowing from heaven this mighty rushing wind, and he means to blow us not about aimlessly through the world, but he means to blow us and guide us in the way that is true and right and proper, in the way that is holy and good and that fits in, in the life of every Christian. So consider which wind is at work in your life. What is inspiring you? you? What are the things that are blowing your life this way or that way? Are they the things of God? Do they conform to his spirit and his mind? Or are you being driven about by anger and resentment? You can see that quite clearly in our world right now, can't you? You can see the bitterness and the division that is at work in our country, and you can see its effects. It is not good to have people who are constantly in strife. It's not good in a marriage, it's not good in a city, it's not good in a country. It only leads to destruction. What is inspiring you? Secondly, the Holy Spirit comes with fire. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, brings heavenly fire. And you hear, heard how in the book of Acts it's described as fire that kind of separates out over the disciples' heads like tongues. Right? You heard that in the book of Acts? Why does the Holy Spirit come with fire? Well, could it be that Jesus is a bit of an arsonist? Could it be that Jesus means to set his church on fire? It's kind of a, a provocative question, isn't it? Every morning I wake up and I pull up the headlines and you see pictures of fires burning. You see these things. It's, it's painful to look at these pictures, to see people's places of business, to see cities being set ablaze. Fire is not a pleasant thing when it is out of control. But in its proper place, 
in the fire pit, in your furnace, in your engine, is, is not fire a wonderful gift from God? We just bought a new house, some of you know this, and I've been cutting out all the underbrush, all the growth that's been growing up. And so I have these piles and piles of dead old twigs, and I love to set them on fire. I love to set them on fire because then I get to sit there and watch these brown, lifeless twigs that would have no purpose, that would do no good. I get to watch them come alive and glow. Maybe you've had this experience. Fire is like nature's television show, isn't it? You can watch the colors changing little by little. You can feel the warmth and the glow of that fire. Everything is better around a bonfire. Well, could it be that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, comes to set the church on fire in that way? Not with a destructive fire from heaven, but with that which is holy and good and true. When the Spirit comes, he comes to set your heart on on fire. And maybe that sounds like something you want to resist. For fire is destructive after all. And it will be that when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ and throughout your life, he does mean to burn away those things which are opposed to God. The Holy Spirit does work in us repentance, which is turning away from what is sinful, putting it to death in us. But that's not a bad thing, is it? It's not any more bad than it is for me to feed my fire with these twigs. For the things that are sinful, everything that is opposed to God will do you no good in the long run. And so feed it into the fire. Repent of your sins. Turn away from those things that are opposed from God, for they do you no good. And they don't do anyone else any good either. And in their place, the Holy Spirit means to work a new life. The Holy Spirit means to work a new life in us, a life of faith in God and love for one another. Do you remember this story of Jesus when he rose from the dead, how he walked with the disciples on the way to Emmaus? We have a painting of it somewhere around the church. It moves every couple of years, so I'm not sure where it is right now. But you see Jesus walking with these two disciples, and it's this marvelous account because Jesus doesn't let them know that he's actually Jesus. And as he's walking, he's talking with And he's explaining to them everything in the scriptures, how the Christ had to suffer, how he had to die, and on the third day how he had to rise. And still they didn't recognize him. And then he makes himself known, remember this, in the breaking of the bread, and they realize who it was. And their hearts are glad. Do you remember what they said afterwards? They said, did not our hearts burn within us? Here is the work of the Holy Spirit in all of its glory. He comes to burn the love of God into your heart so that the things of God don't remain cold, lifeless facts that you keep on a shelf. Yes, I can tell you about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But so that you learn to love God himself and you learn to love the things that he loves. This is why the Spirit comes with fire. So that we would move from being cold and lifeless to full of God's love for him and for one another. This is the work that the Spirit comes to do. And if I can put it in one last term, he comes to build a new kind of city. Let's compare the city that the Spirit builds with the city of Babel. You heard how the Babel, how the, I guess we'd call them Babylonians, how they had this idea. And when I was a kid, I always thought God was kind of mean to them. Did you think of that this morning? Here these people are, they're all united together, and they get an idea to build a new building. To build a city seems like a good project, right? Everybody's working together. They're building this magnificent tower. It reaches up into the heavens. And God comes down and says, I don't like this. Why? When I was a kid, I thought that was rude of God. You know, why didn't he like their building project? It was this. They were trying to build things apart from God. They were founding a city that was entirely defined apart from God from God. Did you hear it? Come, let us make names for ourselves. Come, let us build a tower into heaven. We don't need God to come down from heaven to us. We can reach up and build an earthly heaven. This is what motivates so much of the cities of men in our times. It sounds good, it looks good, it seems good, but eventually, eventually those kinds of cities decay. Eventually, those people who work well together in the beginning start fighting 
with one another. Eventually they start destroying one another and asserting one person's power over another and eventually those cities turn into places of destruction and mayhem. If we went forward in the Bible, we'd find when the Israelites go back to Babylon, it's full of child sacrifice. It's full of warfare. It's full of anger and resentment. And so God in his mercy comes down and scatters that city. May God bring an end to those cities of men that sow that kind of hatred. But in its place, what does he build? He builds a different sort of city. A city that is united not in the building up of man's endeavors, but a city that is built up on the mighty works of God. A city that is united, maybe not in language, but is united in our faith in God and our love for him. Didn't you hear what they said in Jerusalem that day? We hear in our own tongue the mighty works of God. If you're waiting for the Spirit to come with a mighty rushing wind, you're going to wait a long time. If you're waiting for him to appear with fire, I don't think it's going to happen again. But, but if you are looking for the Spirit's work, then look where the word of God is being proclaimed. Look where the mighty works of God are declared to you in your own language. Look to where Christ Jesus himself continues to send his spirit so that you may know that he has come into this world at Christmas to bear your sins and, ra- and rise from the dead at Easter. And now he gives his spirit so that faith in him may grow and love for one another may be increased. Which is greatest? Christmas, Easter, Pentecost? I don't know. They all work together. But today we celebrate Pentecost. We celebrate the coming of the Spirit. And as much as we love to say Christ is risen, he's risen indeed, let us learn to pray with that same eagerness and fervor. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill my heart with the fire of your love. To him be the glory now and always. Amen.